Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brattersine, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the horrifying murders of 14-year-old Tayden Baker and his little brother, 12-year-old Robert Baker. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. All right, now that I'm done begging you to join my cult, we can go ahead and get into this video. Now, this video is on a case out of Melrose, Florida, and it's a more recent case. It took place in August of 2020. And this, what happened to these boys is honestly the stuff of nightmares. I almost didn't cover this case. When I first started looking into it, I was just like, it was very upsetting. I think it just hit a little close to home as a mom of a baby boy. This one affected me a little bit differently, but I decided to put those feelings aside and tell the story of what happened to these boys because I feel like the person, <laughs> I feel like the person who did this is an absolute monster. And if you have any negative energy that you need to send in anyone's direction, like if anyone deserves it, it's this person. If you've been here before, you know, that's not usually how I operate. Sending negative energy to somebody is not something I often advocate towards somebody doing. But once you hear this case, you're going to understand why my blood is boiling. So I'm going to tell you about that today. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer a question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain while we go through all the details. But at the end, I want you to actually revisit it and answer it. And that is this. What, what do you believe was the actual motive for the murders of the Baker brothers? Because truly, I just do not understand. So I'm going to give you all the details and you can answer this question at the end. Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the terrible murders of brothers Tayton Baker and Robert Baker. Now, I want to start this video off with a quote from the state attorney who prosecuted Tayton and Robert's murderer. He said of these murders, and I quote, I can tell you I've been working in the criminal justice system since 1980, and these are some of the most brutal murders I've ever heard of. He attacked these two kids without mercy. So our story today begins on the Wednesday morning of August 26, 2020. And this is in Melrose, Florida, which is about 50 miles southwest of Jacksonville, which is like the biggest city in Florida. It's about 10 a.m. and Sarah Baker is waking up and getting started for her day. She had been sleeping in her room or in a room in the house with her youngest son. And she was just getting up, getting going, going out into the, like the living room to look for her cell phone because she had loaned it to her teenage son the night before. So she gets up and she starts walking into the common area of the home. And that's when she walks into an actual nightmare. She walks into something that no person, no parent should ever have to see. First, there was a blood trail. There was an 18 foot blood trail that led to a form laying on the floor covered with a blanket. So as she approached this form and she pulled the blanket off, she realized that the form under the blanket was the body of her 14 year old son, Tayton, and he had extensive injuries to his neck and he, there was just like blood everywhere. So she freaks out, she panics and she runs to her other son, Robert, to tell him to like, get up and call 911 because something had happened to his brother. But when she rips the blanket off him, she realizes that he too has been killed and he too is soaked in blood. This poor woman had just found two of her sons brutally murdered in her own home where she had been sleeping. And she freaked out. She screamed at the top of her lungs and she ran from her house going to get some help. So now let's discuss what happened here. I first want to talk about who the boys were, the backstory on their family, and then we'll get into, you know, the details of what happened when they were killed. Tate and Scott Baker was born June 12th, 2006, and his little brother, Robert Andrew Baker, was born September 18th, 2007. They were born to parents Chad and Sarah Baker. Chad was a long distance trucker and Sarah was a stay at home mom. She had chosen to stay home after her eldest boy was born so that she could be there to, you know, see every milestone, kiss every boo-boo, be there for their first days of school and help them with their homework, you know, everything. She wanted to be there for everything. Tayton and Robert were two of five boys, which, wow, that honestly just sounds so exhausting. And they had two older brothers, Colton and Colby, who were moved out of the family home um, and living in Mississippi by the time the murders took place. One of them, I believe, had just moved out a week before the murders. And they also had a little brother named Landon, who was just four years old at the time that, this, that, that, that the murders took place. 
they were just two little boys at the beginning of their lives. They were close with their family. They had a big extended family. They were close with their family. They were loved by so many people. They had goals. They had dreams. They had things that they wanted to accomplish and that they should have been able to accomplish, but they can't because their lives were stolen from them by a selfish asshole. Tayton was 14 years old and he was said to be a super happy kid, always smiling with the ability to light up a room with his face and his voice. He was the type of kid who made friends super easily with any other kid that he met. Like everyone loved him who met him. He loved cooking and he loved listening to music, swimming and playing outside. He also was said to be the kind of kid that had a heart of gold and a very gentle soul, described as a giant teddy bear who had a really soft spot and a caring heart for animals and for his family. Like he loved playing with and taking care of his baby brother, you know, the four year old, like he was just one of those kids, man, that had so much life to live. And he seemed like he would have turned into such a good person. And he was so excited for so many things, like normal things that a 14 year old would be excited about, like going on camping trips with his family, playing football in high school, and then going on to continue playing football in college. And he was super excited because he was about to start at a brand new school. His little brother, Robert was just 12 years old, man. And Robert was just one of those kids who excelled at everything he did. He was athletic and smart, managing to maintain a straight A student status. And at his young age, he'd even been offered several scholarships to private schools, but he always turned them down because he wanted to be near his brother because the two of them were very close. They were often referred to as peas in a pod, even though they were sort of opposites. Like Robert was a bit of a tougher kid and Tayton was just this big, soft sweetheart, but they were still said to have the closest bond ever. Robert loved being outside and he had a special connection with nature and animals and he loved playing video games and he was super excited to start playing baseball. And he was super excited that he was going to start being able to go fishing with his papa all the time because now him and his family were living so close to their extended family. So I mentioned that they were both excited to like start at a new school. Basically what happened is that the Baker boy's parents had just recently purchased a new home and they had just 16 days before the murders moved to Melrose from uh, Lakeland, which is where they had lived for ever. And I guess this was a very hard decision to make, but Sarah, the boy's mom, her sister, her younger sister had died um, recently. And her biggest regret was not spending as much time with her sister as she could. So they went back and forth like a lot because they had lived in their home in Lakeland for like a very long time. But they finally decided that being closer to family was more important to them than staying where they had been. So they packed up and they moved into this new home literally two weeks before this happened. It makes me so upset because they couldn't have imagined something like this would happen. You know what I mean? They were just excited to go and be close to family and have the boys growing up around a large, you know, having their village, I guess Sarah's grandma or yeah, Sarah's grandma had like 31 grandkids. So there was a ton of family that was going to be around so that they could have experiences with so many of their family members. They found the perfect home. It was a large five bedroom home with tons of space and it had a game room, a pool, a big backyard, and it was walking distance from the boys' grandpa's house. Remember Papa, it was everything they wanted. And the boys were super excited to have lots of time with family and cousins. You know, they were gonna be so close to everybody and they barely even got to experience this because they were literally killed 16 days after they got there. I can't fathom that. It, it makes me like feel sick. It's so upsetting and the loss of these boys shattered their family. It shattered their community and their, the boys step grandma, her name was Deborah. She said of them. And I quote, they were wonderful boys. They were awesome. They never got in no trouble or anything. They were just good kids. Colby, the boy's older brother said that he hopes and feels like his little brothers are watching over him. Now he says he feels like he has two new guardian angels. And even though Colton and Colby, Colton and Colby were already out of the house. I guess the boys all still stayed super close, right? Like they had been close for years. Moving out wasn't going to make a difference about that. And they were just gutted by what happened to their little brothers, but they were determined to stay strong for them. Now, as I said, the Baker family had just moved to the area. They deliberated for a bit, finally decided to do it. And they bought a home on Shiloh road. And this was perfect. It was a super sweet house. A. B, it was in a very convenient place because it was just right down the street from Sarah's dad's house. So they could get together all the time, never miss any moments, be present in each other's lives. And that's all that they wanted, which, you know, very upsetting for me. But anyways, this house, basically the way it was set up is there was a large main house, which is, you know, where 
the family lived and they had a back house. In reports they call it a shed, but the Baker family themselves call it like a renovation to their home. But it, it hardly matters what it is, but it's back there. So in the main house, there is Sarah, the boy's mom, Chad, the boy's dad, who was, you know, the long distance trucker and wasn't home a lot. And then it was Tayton, it was Robert, and it was the baby boy, the baby brother, Landon. So that's the main house. But then in the back house, there was people living there as well. Sarah had invited some people to live there. And this was her sister, Cynthia, who went by Cindy. Her either boyfriend or husband, it's reported as both, his name was Mark, and the couple's 15-month-old daughter. I guess throughout the years, Cindy and Mark had lived with the Baker family like numerous times. They'd stayed there like eight different times with the Baker family throughout the years because they just kind of needed help here and there. And most recently, I think it was just like five days before the murders, they moved into the back house because Sarah had gone over to Cindy's house and the condition of the home was like not tight especially considering they had this little baby. So she was like, you know what? You guys come stay with me, get on your feet. This isn't a good situation. And this was something that had happened several times because Sarah was the type of person who had a big heart and wanted to help the people she cared about. So she let them move onto her property. I actually forgot to mention there that the sister was also pregnant. So they have the 15 month old baby. She's pregnant, they're struggling. So Sarah was the type of person who she even said, she wanted to set a good example for her sons of showing that you help those in need and you especially help those in need who you love, like people you love, you look out for, you take care of. And she wanted to be a good example for her boys. So she brought them onto the property. Now, that's the situation, that's the house, that's the layout. And now we're gonna get into what happened the day of the murders and the night of the murders. And I already gave you a little synopsis, but we're gonna get more in depth here. So this is just your heads up since it's not, it's really, it's really horrible. So as I said before, Sarah woke up in the morning of August 26 and she went into the common area of her home and that's where she found both of her sons. She says that she didn't even notice how much blood there was or the extent of the damage the boys had sustained until she removed those blankets and then it became very clear. She did testify about this at trial and she told the court exactly what she saw and experienced that morning when she found both of her boys murdered. And it is graphic, but I am going to read a bit of her quote because it is incredibly valuable to hear it from her point of view. And it's important to, to know that this is a real family and this is what this mother went through. So she said of finding her sons that morning. And I quote, when I ripped off the blanket, I knew it was everywhere. Tayton was covered in blood. I ran over to Robert and I'm screaming at him to call 911 and I rip off his blanket. And all I can remember is his head flipped forward and then it banged up against the wall. He was the same thing, soaked in blood. And I didn't get a good look at his injuries. And I didn't get a good look at what his injuries looked like, but I did as far as Tayton's. In that moment, I started screaming at the top of my lungs. Robert, the 12 year old boy was found in the living room with his throat slit end to end. And he was described as nearly decapitated. And there was an obvious opening to his skull. And Tayton was found face down by the family's pool table. And it was clear that he had been alive some time and had been fighting for his life. He had defensive wounds on his hands and there were clear signs of bloody drag marks. And it looked like he had been crawling to get his mom's phone to call for help, which explained the 18 foot blood trail that wrapped around the pool table. And there was one of his bloody handprints found on the wall near where his mom's phone was plugged in. He had clear signs of blunt force trauma, including an abrasion on his face that showed that he was attacked while he was face down. And he had multiple slash wounds to his throat where it appeared the killer had been trying to saw through his throat. Both of these boys had literally been beaten with a hammer before they were slashed with a fillet knife in their own home. The autopsies determined that their cause of death was blunt force trauma from being beaten with a hammer and, you know, blood loss from the deep cuts. When Sarah saw this, which my God, it destroys me that she did. She lost it, dude. She shielded her youngest son, um, his eyes. So he wouldn't see his brothers like this. And she ran from the house trying to get help. And she was just screaming and she ran into the backyard to go to, you know, the back house on her property and was banging on the door, trying to get help from her sister, but nobody answered the door. So she ran and she took off down the street and she ran to her father's house. So when she got to the door, she started banging on the door and she's like, call 911, call 911. I think my sons are dead. And Deborah, the boy's, you know, step grandmother saw was the one who was like dealing with Sarah and didn't believe that it was true. She was like, are you sure? Are you sure this really happened? Are you sure that you're not having a bad dream? And she noticed it, noticed it looking at Sarah that like her nightgown was ripped. So something was clearly going on. 
At this point, things were very chaotic. Grandma and Grandpa drove over to the house separately, and while driving over, Grandma Deborah actually called police, and she was on the phone with them as she drove over, and she actually got there before police and went into the home while still on the phone with police. And when she entered the home, she first found Tayton. And it was very clear to her that he was dead. But despite that, she did shake him and called his name, but he was already gone. She said at this point that she panicked and she thought of Robert and she knew she needed to get to Robert because at this point they don't know what's going on. So she goes in to try to find Robert. She climbs the steps and that's when she sees his little feet. And she says they were the whitest feet she had ever seen. And then she goes a little further and she sees his face. And she says his face is also white and his lips are bluish purple and that there's just blood everywhere. She then told the dispatcher what she had found and the dispatcher told her to get out of the house. And she said that when she initially saw this, her first instinct was that an animal must have gotten to the boys just because of how graphic the scene was. It was after this that grandpa showed up at the house and he was told that like, yes, the boys are gone. And he just freaked out. He screamed like, no, he ripped the screen off the door and he ran inside. But then he found that it, yes, it was true. I truly cannot imagine what this family went through. When I think about their poor mother, experiencing that, seeing that, knowing that people are referring to her son's murders when they say this are some of the most brutal murders that they've ever seen. And then being just haunted by the visions of what she saw. You know what I mean? You can't escape that. You can't scrub that from your mind and losing everything in one fell swoop. And there's nothing you can do about it. It literally makes me like physically ill. So police respond to the call in no time. I think it took them like 12 minutes to get to the house. And this is when Sheriff Gator, yes, they call him Gator, arrived at the home. And when he went through the scene, he said that this was one of the worst crime scenes he'd ever seen in his entire life. So the scene was processed and in doing so, they actually did find both murder weapons on the property. They had found both a hammer and a knife wrapped up in like a towel and it was under the sink in the family's game room. And when they were retrieved, they were both covered in blood. When tested, one of the samples on the weapons was a match to Tayden and the other one was a little bit degraded, but it was believed that it was a very, very close match to Robert. They also found a black sweatshirt at the scene and the blood on the sweatshirt matched the boys, but there was also another DNA profile on it that ended up being a match to their murderer. Police were also able to determine how it was possible that these two boys could be murdered in their home while their mother and the baby were in the home and nobody heard anything. Cause when I'm reading about this, that was my first thought. I was like, how is that possible? It like made no sense to me. But when the officers were like investigating, doing what they do, they realized that because of the installation of the house and the fact that it was a big house, it was a five bedroom home, that when one officer went and stood in the bedroom that Sarah and the baby had been sleeping in and one officer was in the area where the boys had been killed and they called back and forth to each other, they couldn't hear each other. The family was shocked. The community was shocked. The, the family literally could not set foot in that house again after what happened to the boys. And I don't know if they ever did. I think that they just pulled an Amityville and booked it and never went back. Colton said that after his brothers were killed, this was the first time he had ever even seen his father cry in his entire life. They were just completely broken. And I'm sure you can understand like why they were broken. Imagine going through that. Imagine waking up in the morning and finding two of your children murdered in your home you had been in while you slept and and have it so bad that when people looked at them they thought that they had been attacked by animals like that is horrifying and then and then to be their father and to be away at the time to be off long distance trucking and getting this information then having to drive back knowing this is what you're driving home to and just thinking about that the whole time it's just like it's it's the two eldest Baker brothers set up a GoFundMe page to help with funeral expenses and to support the family when their father took time off to grieve, grieve the loss of his sons, you know. The goal was $8,000, but it surpassed that just super fast. And it's not currently accepting donations, but at the time it had over $20,000. Like the last time I checked when it was open, it had over $20,000. This family at that time, I mean, I don't know where they're at now and how they're doing now, but at that time, I mean, it hasn't been that long, so I'm sure it's pretty similar, but they needed like all the help they could get. They had put all of their money into this new house. Chad had even, you know, left his job, started a new job in the area that they were living in. Now he had to stop going to that job so that he could be home and help and like deal with the fact that both of his sons had just been killed. There was all this grief. There was all this trauma and they couldn't even go back into the home that they had just sunk all of their money into because there was just so 
many thoughts that go through your brain in that situation. I can't imagine that. And then on top of that, this is something that people don't think about often, but they had to figure out how to get that house clean. They had to pay, they had to have money to pay for somebody to come in and clean their children's blood up off the floor. And this is something, I talked about this in another case, and I can't remember which one off the top of my head, but it's something people don't think about. It's the family's responsibility to figure out how to deal with that if it's done in their home. You know what I mean? It's just like, it makes me insane. I did see that they ended up moving into a property that I believe Sarah's dad owned. It wasn't ideal, but it was available and they had to do a bunch of stuff to make it like more livable. They had to do a bunch of work on the house, work that they couldn't afford since Chad didn't have a job. And now he was looking for a job that was local. He didn't want to be out driving on the road anymore. He wanted to be home with his family. So he had to find a whole new job. It just sounds so exhausting on top of everything else they were dealing with. Now, it did not take police long to track down the person who was responsible for the boys' murders. Just the night after the murders, an arrest was made. And this arrest was made 15 miles away from the Baker's home in Melrose. And this was in a place called Interlachen, I-N-T-E-R-L-A-C-H-E-N. If you know the area, please let me know how to say that. But this was the hometown of somebody that they knew. This was the hometown of Mark Howard Wilson Jr. Now, Mark Wilson Jr., you may recall, was the boyfriend slash husband of Cindy, the boy's aunt, the guy who lived in the back house on the family's property. And I don't know a ton about him, but I do know that he had been in the family for years. He was considered family to the Baker family. Like he was welcomed in their home as one of them. He had been with Cindy for many, many years. Like what a fucking betrayal. What a betrayal on top of everything else. Now, Mark, who was 30 at the time these murders were committed, did have his fair share of issues. He had been in and out of jail a few times for various reasons. Um, in 2012, he was sentenced to five years on multiple charges that included grand theft auto, cocaine possession, and trafficking of stolen property. And he was sentenced to five years, but he only served four before he was released. He was also said to have a drug problem. Both him and Cindy had a history of sus substance abuse, and at least in Mark's case, it appeared to have been learned. His stepsister later testified in his trial, um, on his behalf, by the way, and said that his childhood was filled with heavy drug use and domestic abuse from his parents. So how Mark and Cindy came to be living on the Baker property this time had little to do, you know, with that part of his history. The, basically what happened is right before they moved in, like, I don't know, a day, I don't know exactly how far before, it doesn't really matter. Sarah had gone over to visit her sister. And when she got there, she found that the apartment was in really horrible condition. It was like flea infested and there were like, the utilities weren't turned on. And this is unacceptable considering they have a young daughter and Cindy's literally pregnant. And on top of that, while she was there, Cindy and Mark were just like openly smoking weed in front of their little baby. At seeing this, Sarah was like, yo, you are, you are fucking up basically. You need to get your life together. You are going to make it so I have no choice but to call CPS because this is absolutely ridiculous. So you need to just like, let me help you because this, this can't happen. And they agreed. They agreed to move to her property so that she could help them get out of the hole they were in because that's the type of person she was. She wanted to help her sister. She wanted to help Mark and she did all of this for them. And then this is what happened. Now, Mark was arrested with detectives saying they were able to find him with the help of some, quote, very keen detective work, end quote. And Gator then posted to the police department's Facebook page saying that the, quote, sick monster who was responsible for the murders of Tayton and Robert Baker had been arrested. At the news of Mark's arrest, Cindy freaked out, as I'm sure you can imagine, because she could not have known that her partner was a monster like this. So she calls another family member, and this is Kelly. I believe this was the boy's cousin. And she tells Ke Kelly, like, oh my God, Mark confessed, Mark did it. And Kelly tells Sarah, yo, Mark is in Interlachen, that's that city, at his mom's house, and he's being arrested for the boys' murder. So they get in a the car, they drive over, and police are already there when they get there. Cindy is questioned by police, and by the time the women leave, Mark is on the ground, and he is in handcuffs. So Mark was in jail and he was charged with two counts of first degree murder, among other charges, and he was held without bail. And while awaiting trial, apparently, he was willing to plead guilty, but the prosecution didn't want to take that plea because they were going after the death penalty. They were like, we would like um, you to die for this. And if any case merits somebody getting the death penalty, it's this one. The prosecutor said that they were so gung-ho about getting the, the death penalty in this case because the murders were, quote, especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel. The prosecutor added that they believed that the murders were committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner, adding that they had a list of aggravating factors that they believed warranted the death penalty, like the fact that he had previously been convicted of a felony and the fact that both boys were killed at the same time. 
I guess the prosecutor did consult with the boy's family prior to making this determination. Like, hey, this is what we want. I wanted to kind of feel them out and see how they felt about it. And they were like all for the death penalty. They were like, I don't want my tax dollars going to keeping this guy alive. Fry him. I don't think they fry anymore, but fry him. Colby Baker, one of the boy's brothers, um, expressed his outrage over this man, man, over Facebook saying, and I quote, it be the people that you let live with you, the people you call family, the ones that acted as if they cared that will really F your whole life up. I really hope you rot in there and I hope you get the maximum sentence possible. You sick book. Now, how did police end up getting on his trail and him getting caught so quickly? Because first, the family was pretty sure he was involved. Like right from the beginning, they were like, I think we should look into Mark. But obviously police need to investigate it and like put a case together. You can't just be like, oh, Mark did it. And they got pretty lucky in this case because like a lot of information fell right into their lap. And one big thing, one like the big nail in Mark's coffin was actually his own mother. It appears what happened here is on the 27th, which would have been the day after the murders, Mark Wilson Jr.'s mother had a meeting with police. And when she got there, she told them like, listen, my son confessed to me that he killed those boys. She says that her son came over to her house and told her what happened. Not that he had done it, but just that it had happened. And now he's, he's here and he's acting crazy. And she was like, you need to cooperate. You need to go to the police. You need to tell them what happened for your side of the story. You need to take a lie detector test and you need to clear your name. And he was like, I can't do that. And then she asked him a question. She asked him an impossible question that she wasn't prepared to hear the answer of. And she asked him like, did you hurt those babies? And he took a pause and he said in a voice that she said was not his own. Yes, I did. She said that he told her that he had messed up and he had hurt those boys, but he told her he wasn't mad or angry when he did it. He did it out of necessity. He felt like he needed to protect his family. And that's why he killed two little boys. Now, the voice not his own thing might have stuck out to you because when I was reading it, it stuck out to me. So I had to look into it. And it turns out that Mark's mother said that whenever Mark would like heavily use drugs, his voice would change and he would speak in a voice not his own. And that's how she knew that he was like really messed up. And it would come out in this case that Mark was heavily using drugs, specifically meth in the days leading up to the murders. So police hear all this from his mother and they're like, wow, okay, thank you for coming forward. That must have been very hard, but we're going to have to ask you for a little more help. Would you be willing to meet your son again, this time in a controlled setting? Let us record it and try to get him to admit to this again, because that would be incredibly helpful because you saying this is great, but him saying this is even better. And she agreed. And I can't even imagine how hard that must have been for her. It's the, obviously the right thing to do. But can you imagine how hard that would be when it's your own child? I, I literally can't. Like there's, it's, there, it's, this case is so sad. So that same day she meets up with her son again, and this time it's being recorded and she gets him to confess to the murders. And during this whole interaction, she asks her son, she says specifically to him, quote, I need an answer. I need to know why you're my child. You need to tell me. I don't get it. I want to help you and I can't. And it's the worst feeling for a parent. You're my child. Look at me. He then told his mother that he did it for Cindy and for his daughter because he felt that he needed to protect them. And it's at this point that his mom obviously gets very upset and is like, protect them from what? From what danger? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Why these boys? Now, the motive for why he killed these two boys changed a few times while he was questioned. In one of his tellings, he says that he killed the boys because he believed these two boys were abusing his baby daughter which is just insane and not true. And then in another telling, he said that he believed the boys were sleeping with Cindy, which is their aunt, which again, is just like my brain. I can't even like process it. And then another telling, which this one seems the most true to me and what makes me think this is why he actually did it. He said that he had killed the boys because he felt like their family was going to report him and Cindy to the Department of Children and Families. And then he dropped a bombshell on police by saying, that he wasn't acting alone, that he was supposed to kill the boys and Cindy was supposed to kill Sarah and the baby. He also said that he was mad at Cindy for not following through with her part of the agreement. And right now you're probably like, holy shit, but I'm not, I'm not dropping a Shyamalan twist on you. He is an absolute fucking liar. Like, I don't know if it's the drugs messing with his head or if he is just crazy, but the police have come out and said she was never look, like, looked at like that. She was never considered a suspect. And when she was like, her reaction to it was that she was 
outraged and just disgusted that he would even say something like that. And her family completely stands behind her. Like the boy's grandpa, which would be her father, said of this, and I quote, if she had any involvement at all, I would be the first one to turn her in. Cindy 100% has nothing to do with it. And then the boy's mother, Sarah, had much of the same to say. She said that she knows her sister and her sister would never hurt her kids, saying specifically, quote, I believe my sister. Yes, 100%. Not a shadow of a doubt that she had no involvement whatsoever. So anyways, Mark's mother gets him to confess. Police now have this recording and they bring him in for questioning. And at first he denies it. He's like, I did not do that. I definitely didn't. But then they show him, they're like, hey, but we, you know, you confess, we hear it. It's right there. And he's like, okay. And he like cracked and he's like, okay, yes, I did. And he tells police that like he found both murder weapons on the property and he used them to kill the boys. And then he listed off his reasons for why he did it, his justifications for why he did it. And the police believed that these were all bullshit and called them highly unreliable or like, un, like they, they were like, no, like that, those are not real reasons. This is not why you did this. So now he's in jail and the community is shocked. And the community was like very vocal. A lot of people were very vocal about being pro death penalty in this case. They were like, look, this guy, there should be no leeway for a person who comes into your house in the middle of the night and kills your children. Like, no. People also came out in heavy support and like love for these boys. A vigil was held and organized by one of the family's neighbors and dozens of teammates and classmates and neighbors came. They were all just feeling the hurt and the loss. It was a small town and everyone knew everyone. So it felt like they were all family and it hurt to know something like this could happen. The boy's father, Chad spoke, and he said that he was like overwhelmed with the outpouring of love and support his family had received. And he said specifically of this quote, I'm blown away from the amount of support from the community for a family that moved two and a half hours north just recently to have this support from the community. It's mind blowing. Family and friends also gathered together a month after the murders. They, ugh, it, it, this would have been right after Robert's 13th birthday when they got together to celebrate. They gathered together at the Little Rain Lake Park in Keystone Heights to sort of remember the boys and to celebrate Robert's birthday. His mom could not hold back tears when she spoke at the gathering saying, quote, he wouldn't want us to forget him, especially he was looking forward to a big birthday party for his 13th birthday. He wanted to sign up for school to do the baseball for Keystone. So we figured this would be a nice honor, a tribute to him not making it to his 13th birthday. Now it took two and a half years for the trial to begin. And during that time, his attorney actually tried to file a motion for an acquittal. Obviously it was denied. They were like, no, absolutely not. And I don't know what grounds he thought he had to have this case acquitted. It seems pretty clear what happened here. And you confess, but you know, it's the defense attorney's job to do what it's the defense attorney's job to do. So the trial finally began and all of the family was there during the trial, of course. And I guess it was just so impossible for them to be that close to the monster who did this during this time. Like it was unbearable at times for them to be that close. And speaking of unbearable, these poor people had to sit there and listen to Mark's attorney's opening statement. And it was clear. It was just a smack in the face, man. I mean, I know again, it's their job, but my God, like Rosemary people, that was or Mo Rosemary peoples. That was his attorney's name. She described Mark in her opening statement as, quote, a comforter, hard lover, father, father figure, end quote, adding that he always wanted love and finally found it in Cindy, but said that everything can't be butterflies and rainbows. So the couple fell on hard times, which, oh my God. She added that her client was remorseful. And as she said that he lowered his head in shame and he cried. And she said that there was no proof that this was a premeditated case. So it shouldn't be treated as a first degree murder case. She said that instead her client snapped because she, not she, because he, Mark believed that these boys were molesting his daughter. So he, as a father, you know, did what he felt he had to do, but that he snapped when he did it. And this makes me so mad because I cannot imagine how Sarah, how Sarah and Chad felt hearing this woman say this. It's just, again, a slap in the face. Now his attorney didn't really have a ton that they could do to like defend Mark because it was so clear that he did it. So basically what they were trying to do was just get him life in prison instead of the death penalty at this point. They didn't call witnesses and had very little they could do at cross-examination. His attorney did have like a radiologist and a psychologist run tests on Mark and present their findings, but it wasn't much. He was just diagnosed with substance abuse and antisocial personality disorder. His attorney did try to say that, you know, Mark wasn't in his right mind when he did this. He had been on meth for several days prior to committing the murders and hadn't slept during that time. And also pointed out that he was introduced to meth by his parents and that he had used meth since he was a child. And because of this, he had brain damage and also intelligence deficits. 
His attorney said that he had been abused by all of the adult caretakers in his life and that both, side of, both sides of his family suffered from mental illness. And basically they were like, listen, at the time of the murders, he was under an extreme emotional distress and he was not able to comprehend just how bad what he was doing actually was, which makes me so mad. <laughs> But then the prosecution, right? They had like a really strong case. They had a lot of evidence against him. They had, you know, his confession, the fact that he ran and left right after the murders, his DNA, all of that, the proximity, he was literally in the backyard. Like they had all of that against him and they had some pretty strong witnesses. His own mother testified against him and testified about the meeting she had with him and how he had confessed to her, which was incredibly powerful. And then Sarah, the boy's mother testified against him and testified as to what she saw that morning. And I cannot imagine that there was a dry eye in that courtroom. Like it was incredibly hard. I know some family members had to leave when she testified. Like Andy, her father had to leave because she, he just couldn't hear her break down like that and describe her, her day like that. She testified about finding her sons and I read part of it to you already. And there was one particular part that really got to me that really like hit me in the heart and just knowing that she had to see this really destroys me. But she said, quote, you could tell that his throat was severed completely through almost to the bone, because that's when I realized there was no pulse. And when she said this, she was talking about 14 year old Tayden. She also testified that she had seen Mark the night of the murders, that she had been out back and she had seen him and they had a totally normal conversation. They just chatted like nothing was going on. And while they talked, he sat there and was sharpening his knife, the knife that was later determined to be the murder weapon. During trial, there were also crime scene photos shown. And I guess these crime scene photos were so bad that a lot of the family members left. They just couldn't sit there and actually see those. And through all of this, all, all of these things at trial, Sarah said one of the hardest parts for her was to look over at Mark and see that he didn't seem to have any sympathy at all for what he had done. The prosecution told the court that Mark had murdered the boys with no mercy, just violent, unrelenting rage a murder committed with, quote, a ferocity that shocked the conscious of us all. And then added that because of that, he should be shown the same degree of mercy that he showed Tayton and Robert. The defense ended with saying that the disorganized and chaotic, you know, nature of the crime scene showed that it wasn't premeditated and instead was done in like a frenzy and that that proved that it wasn't first degree murder. And so he shouldn't be executed. And then added at the end, quote, Mark Wilson can be redeemed. So the jury was sent to deliberate and it took less than an hour for them to come back with their decision. They had found Mark Wilson Jr. guilty of all of the charges against him. And they unanimously recommended that he get the death penalty, though it would be up to the judge to make that final determination. The Baker family was incredibly relieved. They said it was like a weight off their shoulders and they were pleased to know he'd never have the opportunity to do this to anybody else. At this point, basically the only thing that had to be done was it had to be decided how he was going to be sentenced. Was he going to get life in prison with no parole or was he going to get the death penalty? As I said, the jury unanimously recommended the death penalty. And in Florida, that has to be the case in order for them to get the death penalty. Now I did another case where I talked about this. I think it was a Seth Jackson case, but anyways, they all agreed that he should get it, but it was up to the judge to make that determination. But prior to that, there was going to be like a small hearing so that basically attorneys could like beg for mercy for him, even though the kids didn't get any mercy from him. The defense definitely had their work cut out for them because this was a difficult case to defend from the beginning. Cause like it was obvious he did it. He admitted to doing it. And at this hearing in order to, you know, get any mercy, they would have to like present some new, tr new information, something new that would make the judge kind of take a step back and reconsider because it's very rare for a judge to go against a jury's like recommendation. So they would have to have something pretty, you know, substantial to get him to do that. And they just really didn't have anything. During that hearing, Tayton and Robert's family sat on the right and Mark Wilson Jr.'s family sat on the left. And it was a very emotional hearing. Mark apologized and his mother did put up a really moving plea for his life. But the judge was like, man, like he killed two kids. And ultimately he went with the jury's recommendation and sentenced him to death. And the judge said of this, and I quote, the defendant committed two truly horrific murders of innocent children. Tayton's death in particular was especially cruel and undoubtedly painful. The court finds insufficient evidence to override or disagree with the jury's recommendations. Finding that the prerequisites of law have been met and that the jury of his peers has unanimously found death to be the appropriate sentence. 
At hearing this, the courtroom was really quiet. You could hear sporadic cries quietly like throughout the courtroom and people leaned on each other for support. And on Mark Wilson Jr.'s side, you could see that his mother was completely gutted in learning her son's fate and knowing that she had helped put him there. It seems like, a, I feel so bad for her. I don't know her, obviously. I didn't read much about her, but it just seems like it would be such a hard thing to do. It's the right thing, obviously, and it's what she had to do, but to live with that and to know, that has to be a very hard thing to like reconcile. After the sentencing, Kelly, the boy's aunt, did speak. She did make a statement on behalf of the family, talking about how hard it had been since the boys had been killed. And then she said of the sentencing, quote, I felt like this was the best thing that could have happened for the severity of our loss. It will never bring the boys back. I don't think in a case like this there is real justice, but this is the best outcome that could happen for our family. So now we can try it and find a way to move on and find a new normal. She also added, quote, We just want justice, you know. And I think this was the best outcome that could have happened for Tayton and Robert. And you know now that you know he's going to be sentenced to death, you know. We can finally move on and remember them that the way that they were. No family should ever have to experience something this horrific. And it's just something that is going to haunt you for the rest of your life. And the idea that your kid isn't safe, even in their own home while they're sleeping, is something that's really hard to deal with. But we just want justice. The DA was super happy with the decision as well, saying that... You know, Mark didn't get any justice because these boys didn't get any justice and that they were happy that he got the sentence that he did because if anyone deserved it, again, it was him who deserved it. It was he who deserved it. Yeah, it's a better sentence. Sheriff Gator also spoke out about the sentencing of Mark Wilson Jr. saying that he knows that there are going to be appeals like it's inevitable, but that right now they got to win. And then he added that he can't wait for this waste of existence to be transferred from his jail and to death row. He added that nothing will bring the boys back, but this at least closes the door of uncertainty for the family. Saying nothing can fix what happened here, nothing can be justice, the boys are still gone, but this was the closest they could get to some sort of resolution. And that really is a thing, right? Nothing is ever good enough. Like, it'll never feel like enough when it's your kids or somebody you love being murdered. Even Sarah said that she thinks a simple injection is not, is not enough for him. That for her, real justice would be for him to be beaten to death with a hammer, and slashed to death with a knife, and then lay, then lay on the ground, bleeding, screaming in pain and agony, while her entire family stands by and watches him die. And she said even that wouldn't be enough. She said that she was living in absolute denial, but then at some point she just had to wake up and accept the fact that this had really happened, and she said that she was living in a perpetual nightmare that she just could not get out of. And as far as the boy's grandma, she said that she hopes that he rots in a deep, dark hell. And Mark Wilson's Jr.'s family didn't want to speak at all about the verdict or the sentencing. They were like, no comment. Now, I didn't see if he appealed yet. He was just sentenced in January of this year. So, I mean, it, it's still pretty new, but it could happen. I don't think he has much of a leg to stand on, though. Like, I don't know what he could appeal where he thinks he could actually get a better result. I mean, obviously, he's trying not to be put to death, but... You would think you would want to just be put to death if you did something this terrible, honestly. I just hope it's not too hard on their family, because I know that it has to be challenging to sit there and just, like, wait for appeals to happen. But as of right now, I be uh, last I read, he was released into the general population, and the boys' older brothers were happy about this, because they were hoping that somebody would get word of what he had done, and that somebody would give him, you know, the justice that they believe he rightfully deserves. So I don't know. It's just, it's just really sad. The family said that there's nothing you can do, you know, that this happened. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to change it. And there's nothing you can do to scrub the memory of what happened to them from their brains. Like that's something they always have to remember. And their mom just misses them. You know, it's just so sad. She said of this specifically quote, when you first wake up, you wait to see their little faces and them screaming at each other, like mom, this one is grabbing this. And when you don't hear it, reality sets in. And it brings a wave of emotions, and I just want to make it stop, and nothing is ever going to make it stop. But the family has said they just want to move forward with keeping the memories of Tayton and Robert alive, you know, and they do. They do everything they can to do that on their birthdays. They, like, you know, have little parties and release balloons into the sky and have cake and have candles. And his cousin has said this is their way of making sure the boys are still ever present in their in their lives and their memories, and that the boys are there for all big moments. And their mother, Sarah, said of this quote, I want people to remember that they were kind and innocent, fun, outgoing, my babies. I just don't want anybody to ever forget them. 
And with that statement, that, my friends, is the story of the murders of Tayton and Robert Baker. I hope it was informative and it made sense and I gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I want to thank you for remembering Robert and Tayton with me today. And now that I've given you all the information on this case, I want to revisit the question of the day, and that was this. What do you believe was the true motive for the murders of Robert and Tayton Baker? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. And you know what? Also, do you think he deserved the death penalty or should he have been given life in prison? Let me know everything. Just fill, fill the comments and be very, you know, supportive and kind to the family and just... This one's just rough, man. I don't know. But anyways, if you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Um, and if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below, along with a link to my membership where you can get early access to non-sponsored videos, um, occasional live streams, polls, things like that. Um, before you leave, if you haven't already, leave a suggestion down below of what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases. And if you leave me a suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases that you suggest because they're often cases that I haven't heard of or need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.